Helpers in the film industry, what are they? When do they begin? And why should we be paying attention to them? In this video, I'm going to discuss why they are some of the most dangerous things facing film. Let's discuss. Monopolies in the film industry are very relevant today. Despite their roots being traced all the way back to the 1890s, bearing in mind this is only two years after the invention of film, and it was all due to the introduction of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act set out to prohibit the use of anti-competitive agreements and unilateral conduct that monopolises or attempts to monopolise a relevant market. To put it into layman's terms, this act was supposed to do away with monopolies altogether. Before we understand how monopolies were stopped in the early days of film, we need to understand the climate of the film industry back in the 1930s. Cinemas were owned by studios, block bookings were in full swing and actors and directors were connected to one studio. For those who don't know what a block booking is, a block booking is when a theatre bought a rack of films from a movie studio without having seen them beforehand. This meant that most films were completely controlled by the studio, from pre-production to where one would see the film. Now, this annoyed many independent film producers, like Walt Disney and Charlie Chaplin, who grouped together to take this case to the Supreme Court. It was going well until the interruption by incoming President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said that films were distracting people from the Depression, using the National Industry Recovery Act as means of justification. However, this act was done away with in 1935, and a fresh lawsuit against the movie studios was soon filed. In 1946, it was ruled that both block bookings and studio and theatres would no longer be allowed. This case stretched over three decades and helped to dismantle the powers of movie studios. However, as we now know, this is not the end of monopolies in the film industry. Now we move into the 1980s, where there are many interesting developments and changes. For example, we see one of the world's biggest franchises in Star Wars. But we also see a big rise in independent films. A few other big franchises to be born in the 80s were, of course, the likes of Alien and Back to the Future. What did I tell you? 88 miles per hour! At face value, there's no problem with these franchises. But when we look into them, we can see that the franchises take away from the pure stylistic art that is making a film and take down the foundations and instead use them as a means of making money through merchandise and unnecessary sequels. So, why did franchises rise in the 80s? The Big Six. The Big Six were the top six movie studios in the 1980s. Think of one of your favourite films from the 80s. It was most likely made from one of the Big Six. The Big Six were Walt Disney, Warner Brothers Studios, 20th Century Fox, Paramount, Universal and Sony Picture Studios. Fortunately, the attitude of using films as a way of lining pockets hasn't changed as we have moved into the 21st century. We see this in the work of Pixar, who were bought by Disney and they've only managed to produce sequels, or so it seems. In the beginning, Pixar looked though they might be a fairly original animation studio, with 9 out of their first 10 films being originals and only one being a sequel. Their films were not only children's films, but they were good, well-built plot lines that everyone could get on board with. They were always wanting to innovate and not to rest on their previous successes. However, out of their next 10 films, 6 were sequels. So. What changed? Saying this, it's not Pixar and John Lasseter who are solely at fault for the current wave of sequels they are bringing out. It's the company that bought them outright in the 2000s. Disney. After the creation of classic Pixar films like The Incredibles, Finding Nemo, Disney decided to buy out Pixar. Prior to the buyout, they were just a heavy influencer in Pixar, but now they had the power to control everything about Pixar. This effectively ruined Pixar's credibility. It isn't Pixar's fault that they've went against their word, but instead it's Disney's. And this doesn't even scratch the surface of Disney's domination in the film industry. Okay, so let's discuss. As many of you will know, they own several other companies and franchises, such as Marvel Studios, Lucasfilms, and ABC Media. Now, let's take Lucasfilm into account. After the critical failure prequels, George Lucas made it abundantly clear that there would be no follow-up to the Skywalker saga. However, after Disney bought out Lucasfilms, they commissioned a new trilogy, even though the creator of Star Wars thought it was milking a dead cow. We can see that Disney didn't care about the artistic integrity, but in fact, they wanted to make money by prying upon diehard fans of an infamous franchise. Sitting there going, uh, yes. You can see this again in Marvel, who comic fans will go to the cinema regardless of the quality of the film. For example, Avengers Age of Ultron was a masterpiece of plot holes and boring plot lines. However, managed to gross over 1.4 billion at the box office. This is 400 million more than Christopher Nolan's classic, The Dark Knight, which is regarded as the best comic book film of all time. At this point, you might be asking, what is the problem with monopolies, apart from making a buck 
from bad films. The major concern of monopolies in the film industry is globalisation. For those who don't know, globalisation is the process by which businesses or other organisations develop international influence or start operating on an international scale. Many can see globalisation as a good thing, as we can become more connected, and that was always inevitable with the creation of the internet. However, when considering globalisation in the context of a film, I see it as a negative. To me, globalisation is streamlining our films. The variety of blockbuster films back in the 80s has turned into similar storylines and acting. How many times have you went to the cinema and thought, this is familiar? Furthermore, the immense amount of cultural diversity that is happening over all aspects of our life has seemed to missed out by film. An example of this, Moana. Moana is set in ancient Polynesia and was meant to be used as a tribute to some of the tribes that used to exist on those islands. However, because of meddling and Disney wanted it to be a family friendly fun adventure, the movie just seemed a bland mix of stereotypes and whitewashing. Now I'm not saying that they animated the characters white, however it just seemed there was a lot of western culture for it to be a tribute to Polynesian tribes. Considering that the two main writers were both American born, you can start to see why the film is being criticised. However, this is just one speck of paint on the ever growing picture of globalisation. Netflix has been a massive aid in the growth of globalisation. Around the world you are exposed to their TV series about American politics, American drug dealers, American female prisoners, American teenagers. The key word being American. We're gonna build the wall. How can we maintain our unique cultures when every TV show and film is coming from the land of the free? You may say that there are specific platforms for specific cultures. However, I as a viewer in the UK cannot experience Bollywood films because I don't have Indian Netflix. Moreover, globalisation has meant that these big budget films are being exposed worldwide and that means there is less need for low budget independent films. This has led to the low budget films being crushed. Between 2010 and 2014, films budgeted under £500,000 have fallen by 50% in the UK. The UK seems willing to see a decline in the low budget film industry and independent films. While well, countries such as France are trying desperately to keep these independent film industries thriving. The UK doesn't seem to be making an effort. A lack of independent cinema association has meant a decline in independent cinemas, which means there's a decline in independent films being screened. Now, how often do you see a chain of multiplexes screening an independent film? There needs to be action soon. However, even then it might be too late for the independent film industry. So, what is the future of the independent film industry? Now, I'm not going to predict the future, but I am going to suggest two possible paths that we could go down. One, where we keep the current path of letting monopolies rise and the American culture become ever present in our home lives. Where the independent film industry will die out. Or, we could go down the second route, adopting a French style system where the proportion of films shown in cinemas have to be home-grown. Unfortunately, I have to say it looks like monopolies in the film industry aren't just a thing of the past. It took over 20 years all of that time ago to get some restrictions on film companies. However, because of globalisation and a craving of money, film giants once again have become monopolies. There are policies that governments can pass so that independent films have a fighting chance. However, with a lot of people content with lazy sequels and massive franchises repeating themselves, there aren't a great deal of people willing to fight for independent films and against the ongoing monopolisation in the film industry. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today on The Scope. On behalf of everyone here at The Scope, We'd like to thank you for your time and furthermore we hope you enjoyed the discussion and perhaps we will see a change in the film industry in the near future. Take care. In the film is a farty there. I'm so <laughs> Oh no! That was actually no. so oh, good. One more. more. Until the end. Oh my god. Ah, sorry. Just need to break. Yes, of course. Right.